why does the universe seem to be so perfectly fine-tuned for life? At the beginning of the 20th century, we discovered that the universe had a beginning, is having a middle, and one day, will have an end. And the details of this story depend on a series of fundamental physical constants, such as the rate of expansion of the universe or the ratio between the mass of the electron and protons, which are the particles that form atoms. And it didn't take long for some people to notice that these fundamental values of the universe seem strangely fine-tuned for life to exist. Or, less boldly, if the parameters that determine the history of the universe were slightly different, complex structures like galaxies, solar systems and life would not exist. This is the question raised in the book Cosmology by the astronomer Hermann Bondi. In this book, he dubbed it Large Number Coincidences. The large numbers he refers to are the age and the rate of expansion of the universe. Decades later, the astronomer Brandon Carter read the book and was motivated to publish one of the most controversial papers in the history of physics, Large Number Coincidences and the Anthropic Principle of Cosmology. In this article, Brandon did the unthinkable and challenged the most basic and ancient principle of modern science, the Copernican Principle. The Copernican Principle did not always have this name, but the idea has been ingrained in science since Isaac Newton. The principle states that the Earth is not special, we are not the center of the universe, and there is nothing particularly special about the Earth, the Sun, or us human beings. Perhaps the greatest triumph of this idea was the unification of astronomy and the study of motion, thanks to Isaac Newton's law of universal gravitation. Newton showed that the laws governing the motion of planets and stars are the same laws that govern an apple falling on Earth. And all the advancements in science up to the middle of the 20th century pointed to similar unifications. The Sun is not a special star, nor is our galaxy very different from the others. Humanity could have emerged at any other point in the universe, and everything would basically look the same to us. All the physics developed after Newton seemed to agree with the Copernican principle, the idea that we are not special. Hey, Pedro here. This video you are watching was originally in Portuguese, my native language. This is the attempt of our team to translate it to English, and I sincerely hope you enjoy it. Your feedback is extremely important to us. Now, back to the video. And yet, cosmology presents an unsettling question. If we are not special, why does the universe seem to be so perfectly fine-tuned for life? Could this have some significance? Or is this all just a big coincidence? We will call this problem the calibration problem. And it was to try to answer the calibration problem that Brandon proposed the first versions of the anthropic principle. Even before explaining what the anthropic principle is, I already have to explain some controversies about it. I said that this was the most controversial idea in science, and it was not for nothing. The first obvious and immediate criticism I need to get out of the way is the name, anthropic principle. Terrible. The term anthropic means relating to human beings. However, in its most useful formulations, the principle has nothing to do with humans specifically. And in fact, interpreting it as being associated only with humans does not lead to the most interesting versions of the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle would equally apply to aliens. It is not restricted to humans alone. So the principle is more about why the universe has complex structures like galaxies and living beings rather than about humans specifically. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, what is the anthropic principle? It depends. And if you think I'm messing with you trying to make the video longer on purpose, I swear I'm not. The philosopher Nick Bostrom has done extensive work on the anthropic principle and he found more than 30 versions of the principle in the literature, many of which had nothing in common with each other. Carter's original idea of the anthropic principle has generated dozens of new principles based on the initial idea, but which lead to discussions in completely different directions. And even when taken to different discussions, most still retain the terrible name of the anthropic principle. So what we are going to do in this video is look at four very different versions of the anthropic principle, what they mean and how they can be used to address the fine-tuning problem. The first version of the anthropic principle seems almost like an obvious truth, and it kind of is. This is the weak anthropic principle. And he states the following. The laws and physical constants of the universe have to be consistent with the fact that intelligent life exists. Or reversing the logic a bit, we know that we exist, Therefore, this means that the universe is compatible with our existence. It is obvious that all the physical constants have values that are consistent with life, because if that were not the case, life would not exist to measure these constants. This logic applies even to the laws of physics that have not yet been discovered. 
No matter what we discover in the future of science, no discovery will invalidate the existence of life because we know that life exists. The weak anthropic principle is basically using our own existence in the universe to limit the type of physical phenomena we can observe. An example is the age of the universe. In the primordial universe, it was very hot and dominated by radiation. Structures like galaxies, planets, and life could not form in this situation. And in the distant future, the universe will be without stars capable of hosting planets with life. So, without conducting any experiments or looking through a telescope, we can know that the age of the universe is between these two extremes. Living beings would not be able to observe a universe in a period unsuitable for the existence of those same living beings. Which, when you stop to think about it, is kind of obvious. And it really is. The statement of the weak anthropic principle is true. Its problem is what conclusions we can draw from this true statement. Let's go back to the problem of universal calibration. The fact that it seems the universe is calibrated for life. And then we will apply the weak anthropic principle to this problem. The reason the universe seems perfectly calibrated for life is that if it were not, there would be no living beings to observe the universe. Any universe that harbors living beings will seem perfectly calibrated for those living beings. This is to be expected. What would be strange is life existing against the laws of physics in the universe. Putting it another way, if a living being is capable of observing the universe emerge, it will always think that there is a great cosmic coincidence behind its existence, because it cannot be any other way. So, the universe appearing calibrated for humans should not be so shocking, and perhaps it does not even need a deeper explanation. And this is how the weak anthropic principle solves the problem. The universe seems calibrated because it could not be otherwise. Thus, the calibration problem is not really a problem and does not need an answer. The idea of giving up on explaining a topic as interesting as the apparent universal calibration greatly displeases scientists. And it is, in part, for this reason that some physicists try to take the anthropic principle even further. Instead of stopping where the weak anthropic principle stops, as a justification for unexplained coincidences, the strong anthropic principle takes a step further and uses the existence of life in the universe as evidence in favor of certain physical theories. The strong anthropic principle states that the fact that humans exist in the universe implies certain facts about the universe. And the most common conclusion of the strong version of the anthropic principle is that the existence of humans is evidence for the existence of a multiverse. Yes, we are going there. The idea is as follows. If there are multiple universes, and in each universe the laws of physics are different, there will be some universes suitable for intelligent life, even if the majority are not. Naturally, intelligent life will only exist in those universes that seem calibrated for its existence. And since intelligent life exists, Theories that include the multiverse are more likely than theories that do not have a multiverse. In this reasoning, the anthropic principle was used as evidence in favor of the existence of the multiverse. Our own existence is used as scientific evidence, as a valid experiment. And the idea of using our existence in this way seems to directly violate the Copernican principle. Thinking this way places us in a special position in the universe, as a central point of evidence for an explanation of how everything works. And this is the conflict that makes the anthropic principle so controversial. On one side, the Copernican idea, which wants to keep science pure and use only direct and indirect experiments to understand and explain the nature of the universe. And on the other hand, the strong anthropic principle offers solutions to difficult problems by appealing to something special in our existence. These two extremes are just didactic. In fact, most books and articles about the anthropic principle include all kinds of arguments for and against the principle and its variations. And since we are talking about didactic extremes, there are two more interesting versions of the anthropic principle at completely opposite ends of the discussion. The first is the strongest version ever imagined of the anthropic principle, so much so that it is called the final anthropic principle. In the early 1990s, the physicist John Wheeler, who is one of the most creative minds in the history of physics, presented a curious idea. Perhaps the universe is not made of matter or energy, but of information. Wheeler's idea is that the most complete description of the universe will start from the fact that information exists and is conserved, and from this, deduce the rest of the laws of physics. This is the idea behind the phrase it from bits, matter through information. One way to interpret this idea is that the universe is, in some way, a large computer, whose goal is to maximize information processing. All material events in the universe would be just an elaborate type of computation. 
And intelligent living beings are especially good at processing information, some more than others. So, if the goal of the universe is to process information, it makes sense that the universe would find a way to create living beings just for that. More directly, living beings are a fundamental part of the universe. The laws of physics must ensure that intelligent life will emerge. This is the final anthropic principle. The idea that intelligent life is not a coincidence or an evidence, but a fundamental piece of the universe itself. There are more possible formulations of what I am calling the final anthropic principle, but they all attempt to make life essential for the existence of the universe. This is the strongest possible version of the anthropic principle, and it is so strong that it ends up being weak, because it has some rather obvious holes. According to the calibration problem, humans exist, and this is strange because we think that the universe does not need to create life. But if the universe needs life to make sense, why does the universe seem so bad at creating intelligent life? Intelligent life exists on only one of the eight planets in our solar system, and we have not yet found any signs of intelligent life outside of Earth, and not only that. Life as we conceive it can only exist on the surface of planets, which is an infinitesimal portion of the true size of the universe. If we believe in the final anthropic principle, the calibration problem is turned on its head, and now it seems strange that the universe is not even more friendly to life. Perhaps the main use of the final anthropic principle is precisely to defend the Copernican principle, showing how strange it becomes to think about the universe when we place life on a special pedestal in relation to the rest of the universe. On the other hand, the weak anthropic principle remains true. Indeed, I am not a random piece of matter in the universe. I am in fact a very specific piece of matter, structured in an organized way and actually capable of thinking. And the laws of the universe need to be compatible with the fact that I exist in this configuration of atoms and molecules. But at the same time, I don't think it's a good idea to use the fact that I exist as a crucial element of a scientific theory. I'm not that important. And that raises the question. Is it possible to reconcile the Copernican principle with the idea that the universe is strangely calibrated for life? This is what Nick Bostrom tried to do with his version of the anthropic principle, which he calls the self-sampling hypothesis. Bostrom's idea is a combination of the Copernican principle and the anthropic principle. Applied to cosmology, the self-sampling hypothesis presents the following idea. The class of intelligent living beings is indeed somehow special, because it represents a very unique type of thing that exists in the universe. But humans themselves are not special within this class of possible intelligent living beings. For example, imagine a hypothetical world in which humans evolved from insects, and another in which humans evolved from birds. Or even another universe in which humans only emerge 10 billion years in the future relative to our timeline. From a more philosophical point of view, all these worlds are basically the same thing. A flash of intelligence in the middle of the universe to understand what is happening around it. Humans are one of the potential possibilities. And what is more important is the fact that we understand that we exist, that we can see ourselves and understand how strange it is to exist, in fact. For this reason, this version is known as self-sampling. We are trying to use ourselves as a source of information about the universe. So, when we are thinking about experimental results, it is important to remember that, yes, our existence implies certain facts about the universe. Bostrom even includes a mathematical formula to evaluate how our existence should affect the confidence we have in certain hypotheses about the universe, such as the multiverse hypothesis. But it is also important to remember that a universe with humans is just one of many possible hypothetical universes with life and we cannot attribute an exaggerated importance to the fact that we exist. But we need to find this balance between understanding the implications of our existence without attributing too much importance to it. Bostrom's idea is not to provide a definitive answer to the calibration problem, but rather to develop a more serious and structured way of thinking about the anthropic principle. And in this, Bostrom captures why the anthropic principle is so controversial. Because depending on what you already believe, you arrive at different conclusions about what the anthropic principle means. The anthropic principle is an open discussion about the implications of our existence and not a solution to a specific scientific problem. An important step in advancing human knowledge is often to give up on an immediate answer. Take a step back and think carefully about what we are discussing. But for you, why do we exist? What is the meaning of life for you? I would love to know in the comments, 
Thank you very much and see you next time.